IPP on this very important occasion for indigenous peoples that is celebrated all over the world. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to every one of you. <laughs> I will straight away go to the matter of this session without wasting time. Uh, first, a bit of a background. The inclusion of indigenous people's right to self-determination in international law ushered in new hope, particularly the adoption of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And this gave a push to the states to make new commitments to protect indigenous people's lands and to increase or grant autonomy to indigenous peoples in consonance with other relevant international laws. With this conception of self-government and autonomous development approaches have been emerging from the experiences of indigenous peoples across the globe. Through these experiences, indigenous peoples have begun to redefine the notion of democracy and development. Our approaches visualize a broader scope of political life where spirituality, cosmology, art, and human relations are integrated into the process and popular political dimensions where men and women in the community are making decisions based on their values of respect for diversity and inclusiveness. Thus, indigenous peoples are demonstrating that we still have the cultural and organizational resources to create alternatives for our own development and to assume control over our political life. However, states are retreating from their commitments and initiatives taken. New laws that came into existence are hardly implemented and ongoing <coughs> peace talks and dialogues seems to be hitting a dead end, like the Chittagong Hill Tracks Accord, the Naga peace talks in Northeast India, and the peace negotiations and transition in Myanmar. We also see that human rights situation is deteriorating, and vast number of indigenous communities are losing the lands, territories, and resources. Further, there is little empirical evidence on the effect of rule of law on the practice of uh, by state. This raises a number of questions, and some of these questions we will be attempting to address in these sessions are, why has the so-called liberal democracies in Asia become such illiberal democracies and authoritarian? What does self-determination mean for indigenous peoples? Does it mean embracing the state structure or does it mean something deeper and more meaningful? Does the conception of self-government by indigenous peoples imply different forms of democratic values and practices rooted in consent making, reciprocity between individuals and within the collective and living in symbiosis with nature that underpins a community living. Now, these are big questions, but I'm happy that we have very distinguished and qualified panelists for today's session to address some of these questions. Now, before we go into the sessions of the presentation, let me just give you an overview of how this program will flow. First is that I will introduce the panelists and then they will speak turn by turn. And after the panelists have finished, the special remarks will come. And after the special remarks is done, I will be asking questions to each of the panelists which, to which they will be responding. And after that will be the Q&A session coming from the audience. So for the audience, therefore keep note that on the right side of your screen, you will see this icon questions. So please type your questions as specific as possible. If whether and mention whether this is directed generally to the panelists or to the specific panelists. 
And please note that only questions that is coming on coming in in this box would be taken by the moderator. No. After that, if we have the time, we will have some responses from each of the panelists, and then we will close the session. So I am really looking forward to this important and interesting session with all these big questions that we'll be attempting to address. Uh, and I'm sure that each of the audience will also enjoy this session. Now, the first speaker will be Windel Bolangit. Windel belongs to the Kankanaya and Bontok indigenous peoples from Mountain Province of the Philippines. He is currently the chairperson of the Cordillera People's Alliance, an alliance of 307 grassroots indigenous peoples organizations and sectorial alliances in the Cordillera region, Northern Province of Philippines. He is also the national convener of the Katribu National Alliance of Indigenous Peoples in the Philippines. Windell is known as an environmental activist and a human rights defender who has been working to promote and advance Indigenous peoples' rights at local, national, and international levels for more than half of his life. Simultaneously, he has been experiencing harassment, intimidation, and surveillance by the Philippine National Police, Armed Forces and, uh, of the Philippines, and their supporters. Uh, his name was dropped from the terrorist list in 2019, along with the names of our former leader, the Calderella People's Alliance, like Vicky Tolly Corpus, because the accusation was simply baseless. So he is a very strong grassroots leader. So now I will give him the time to speak on the first topic that is on challenges to democracy in Asia and the right to self-determination of indigenous peoples. Where are we heading, Winder? Uh, thank you, Gam and uh, to all the uh, participants of this webinar. Uh, good afternoon from the Philippines. I will uh, try to uh, respond to the question raised for the special topic, specific topic. And I will focus uh, more on the uh, situation here in the Philippines. These days, indigenous peoples in Asia are affected by the health and socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19 pandemic as we witness the uh, rapid weakening of democracy. In the Philippines, the state and government under President Duterte has exploited the COVID pandemic in attacking democracy. Instead of comprehensively addressing this COVID problem, which is a life and death problem of the people now, not only in the Philippines, but worldwide, the Duterte government is hell-bent on imposing tyranny and fascist rule in the country. State fascism protects corporate plunder and the destruction of indigenous lands and territories. And uh, as a result, our right to self-determination as indigenous peoples is increasingly disregarded and violated amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Bogus democracy begets bogus self-determination. The recognition of the right to self-determination of indigenous peoples is an exercise of democracy. If a state or government is truly democratic, then indigenous people should be enjoying their collective rights to self-determination. Lands, territories, and resources and our culture and identity, both in paper and in practice. Is this the situation in Asia? No. In fact, we are currently suffering from the impacts of rising militarism in the region. As we are grappling, grappling with the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic, the Philippine Congress 
railroaded the passage of the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020 or Republic Act 11479, which was signed into law by President Duterte on July 4 of this year, despite strong and widespread opposition. The law has an overbroad definition of terrorism and it creates an anti-terrorism council composed of generals and Duterte's minions to be the ones to designate individuals and organizations as terrorists. Further, the law authorizes this anti-terrorism council to order the arrest of designated and even suspected persons without warrants of arrest under detention in unspecified facilities without formal charges for 14 to 24 days. This terror law endangers our collective rights as indigenous peoples to ancestral lands, territories, and self-determination. The actions we take to defend our ancestral domains and assert our right to self-determination can easily be misinterpreted as acts of terrorism. It also increases our vulnerability to red tagging, police and military surveillance, threat harassment, intimidation, enforced disappearance, assassinations, and extrajudicial killings. It is aimed at suppressing democratic action, and it paves the way for a massive crackdown on democratic organizations and seriously threatens what remains of democracy in this country. It is especially dangerous for us because our organizations and leaders have been tagged as terrorists by the government maliciously. Thus, this law is not aimed at addressing terrorism. In no way does it solve the COVID-19 pandemic that continues to claim lives. It is a legislated monstrous attack and violation of human rights, democracy, and self-determination. It paves the way for a reign of terror and plunder of indigenous people's lands and territories. Our discourse on the systemic obstacles on democracy and self-determination that we want to discuss here requires a grasp of the basic contradiction in the case of the Philippines in Philippine society wherein the Philippines is rich but majority of its people are poor. This is rooted in our social pyramid structure wherein the ruling elite at the tip of the pyramid they control the economic and political power to the detriment of the masses including indigenous peoples at the base of the pyramid. Unless this structure is democratized the basic goal of social justice and self-determination cannot be achieved fully. Self-determination will continue to be a difficult uphill climb, especially at present when states and governments increasingly become fascist and militarist with obstacles inherent in an unjust pyramid structured society. The foremost obstacle in exercising self-determination is the resistance to genuine democratic change by those at the top at the tip of this pyramid government laws policies the military the police and the entire state machinery generally operate for the status quo which upholds this pyramid structure and systematically denies and violates the collective rights of indigenous peoples to self-determination, lands, and territories. Just an example, under this administration of President Rodrigo Duterte, violations against individual and collective rights of indigenous peoples were sent to an ethnocidal scale. Development aggression and militarization gravely impact on the lives of indigenous communities. At least five dam projects are bound to affect more than 110 indigenous peoples from at least 106 villages. 230 approved mining applications are encroaching in at least 542 
245 hectares of ancestral lands. From June 2016 to September 2019 last year, there have been 86 extrajudicial killings. These are indigenous peoples and 66 frustrated extrajudicial killings. There have been trump up charges and which caused the arrest and detention of at least 196 indigenous peoples. Militarization has also further resulted in the internal displacement of indigenous peoples. From June 2, 2016 to August 30 last year, there were 84 documented incidents of forced evacuations of communities affecting more than 31,000 indigenous peoples. Just to substantiate and give us an example on the uh, uh, concrete situation to support what I have stated a while ago. Self-determination is the right of the indigenous communities to freely determine their continued existence as distinct peoples and the right to freely determine their political status and their socioeconomic, political, and cultural development at a pace which they themselves define. They share a common history of national oppression and colonization, a common persistence of indigenous peoples, institutions, and cultures, although in varying degrees, common problems and common enemies, and common solution. Indigenous peoples in the Philippines cannot be taken in isolation from the wider Philippine realities, and of course, the incursions of imperialist globalizations, the same is true in other countries. We are still in a struggle. We are still struggling for our right to self-determination. We are not yet in power and in control of our own communities and territories. While states and governments in power are not truly democratic. The international struggle for the recognition of indigenous people's rights has achieved one victory with the passage of the UNDRIP. However, realities on the ground are very far from these international standards. The key issue is the empowerment of indigenous peoples and the level of organization they are able to build. The struggles that they can successfully wage, including the support that they can generate from the wider population in the country and internationally. It is important to know our common enemies and our allies. We must dare to struggle and dare to win. We need to strengthen our grassroots movements and empower our communities. And let us continue to persevere in active discourse as we do today. To conclude, it is necessary to have a com comprehensive knowledge of our history and it's a challenge to have a clear, firm grasp of our present and future social, political, and economic well-being, let us more, uh, let us build more allies, both indigenous and non-indigenous peoples, and link up with the wider people's movement in our homelands and overseas. Let us unite, strengthen our unity as an indigenous people's movement for self-determination and liberation. Thank you. Good day, indigenous brothers and sisters and friends. Thank you very much, Windell, for that very powerful presentation. I think you have raised very important points as to how this COVID-19 has been used as a cover to systematically increase repression and promote militarism uh, in the garb of anti-terrorism and so on. And as you have rightly said, bogus democracy can only deliver bogus rights and bogus self-determination i think uh, and also you have raised the necessity of understanding a situation in a concrete terms and alliance building and doing away with our contradictions so thank you very much mr windell and uh, now with that we will move to the next uh, speaker our next speaker is Ms. Ruka Sambolengi. She is the first female Secretary General of the Indigenous Peoples Alliance of the Archipelago, Aman, 
the world's largest indigenous people's organization. Ruka is a Torajan from the highlands of Sulawesi, a starfish-shaped island the size of Florida. She is known for her oratory and her long uh, time dedication to the indigenous people's rights Hello. movement. Hello. 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 Can you hear me, please? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. 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 Uh, this is Bidayak. Bidayak, we can hear you. So yes. You just come online. Okay. We are in the middle okay. of the session. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry for that. Okay. Carry on, please. Yes. So um, her parents hosted a meeting in 1993, way back in 1993. That is often cited as its genesis of indigenous movement in Indonesia. Ruka completed her first, her master's degree in political science uh, at the University of Chulalongkorn, uh, Bangkok, Thailand. And she will also be speaking on this topic of <clears throat> what does self-determination and self-government mean for indigenous peoples? Uh, sorry, challenges to democracy in Asia and the right to self-determination of indigenous peoples. Where are we heading? Ruka, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I'm still uh, very new to this and I don't know how to share my screen presentations. Uh, if you can help me, uh, anyone here. But I have prepared, um, sorry, uh, this is technical. How do, how do I do this? Um, okay. okay, Ruka, you will see the icon sharing at the top of the right hand corner. Yeah. After that sharing, can you click that icon, show screen? So I do this. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes, we can yes. see. Please go ahead. No, not this one. Why, why it turns out to be different one? Yes. Okay. No, I got it. Yeah. This is the thing when we have uh, multiple pres uh, webinars coming up in one day. Uh, anyway, uh, I would first would like to uh, send my regards to um, everybody here in these uh, webinars and also to our indigenous uh, brother sister uh, in every uh, corner of the globe uh, especially in Asia I would like to say Manasu Moraka and that's the greetings in our language uh, that means actually have the food ready uh, are the food cooked already? So that shows, shows the importance of uh, our uh, collective and uh, rice of food are very important in our culture. So uh, as we're talking about uh, self-determination and self-government in particular, I think we, uh, as mentioned uh, already by Windle earlier, my hello brother, how are you? Uh, this, when we want to see the universal standard that we are having now is really the United Nations on the rights of indigenous peoples in the article 3 that says that indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination. Uh, they freely determine their political status, their economic, uh, social and cultural development. Uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, in these things, uh, I think it is very uh, clear that it, it has become the uh, universal norms uh, and value that right to self-determination is fundamental and also related, cannot be separated with the other rights of indigenous peoples. But what I say uh, fundamental because without exercising our rights to self-determination, we, there is no way we will be able to exercise our other rights uh, as indigenous peoples, either that collective, also the our individual rights. Um, and then uh, therefore, um, 
but however we are limited yeah we are limited by the article 4 uh, and also the article 5 the article 4 and i think there is also a, uh, a story or reason behind this article uh, 4 as this is the united nations uh, declarations which which the member are the uh, nation states so uh, it is it is it is impossible to to uh, uh, to exercise our rights to self determination, they won't allow us to have that. Uh, to to they won't they don't they didn't want to write that on paper, uh, our full uh, rights to self determination. But then they limit it into autonomy and self government. Um, and then again they limit again to our internal and local affairs as we uh, as as uh, as we choose. Um, but even if with the limited um, with limited right political rights to determination in the political uh, element, we still facing problems as um, uh, our brother uh, Windel mentioned earlier. But I don't want to go long to that. But I would uh, actually would like to share uh, the extent, the vital role uh, and impact from exercising our rights to, uh, to self-determinations. Uh, I would like to say that in all matters, when we exercise our rights to self-determination, and especially in making decisions, as our decision-making process is always very inclusive, and that gives the legitimacy of the results of our decision-making processes. Whatever result we have we, uh, from our decision-making processes, it's always uh, have the legitimacy. And then in the case when we, uh, we uh, exercise our right to self-determination, including the exercising our rights to free prior informed consent, then that's actually reducing tensions or conflict in development project, either by private sectors or with government. I don't, I'm actually very reluctant, and it's, I, I have been stated that over the years that I don't like to call, call it conflict because that's really land grabbing. We indigenous peoples, we never ask for conflict. It is the private sectors and government who come and grab our land. And if we, if we stand to uh, defend our land and then they call it conflict. So I, I never use that conflict actually for ourselves because we never, indigenous peoples, we never, uh, that's why I always put that quotes uh, if, uh, and unquotes if it's in my presentations. Um, and I would also uh, uh, like to convince all of us that uh, actually if we exercise uh, full control uh, over our territory and resources, we actually can better contribute to development, either that's economic, social, cultural, and including, yeah, including the uh, reduced cost of what so-called conflict. Because we've seen that uh, the private companies they they spend so much money, a huge amount of money to what so-called conflict uh, settlement. And then what most importantly from what is going on now and what we learn from Indonesia is that the ensuring the resiliency of indigenous peoples, uh, uh, the self-determination is playing very crucial, critical, vital role in ensuring the uh, resiliency of indigenous uh, peoples. It's very clear that the biocultural diversity where indigenous peoples can exercise our uh, rights of self-determination is uh, greater than where we don't uh, or being affected from our territory. And also, uh, I would like to say the actually the global, the humanity uh, resilience, especially in responding to COVID uh, and other crises, uh, other climate crises. The, what we heard from the elders, uh, from our indigenous communities saying that this is not the last uh, crisis we have. Uh, uh, this crisis now, uh, coupled with the already already ongoing climate crisis, is actually they together just unfolding the future uh, severe and probably even uh, much more severe uh, crisis in the future. That's why it is so important to holding on, uh, ensuring the indigenous resilience, uh, resilience that will 
will support, will make sure, uh, will contribute to the resilience of, of the globe. Um, so this is, uh, I can share my presentation later. I saw the examples of econ economic contributions of indigenous peoples. Uh, we call it the valu economic valuations. Even if we evaluate non-tangible, non-cultural, uh, because we cannot, uh, there's no way we can uh, evaluate uh, our a uh, rituals, our cultural aspect, but just the direct access to our resources is already much, much higher than the contributions of a uh, private sectors to our local economy. Uh, and that's why I always believe that actually we indigenous peoples, we are the one who developed our own country. Um, I want to share some uh, lessons. I think Window already mentioned earlier a, uh, about the, um, the violations of our rights to self-determinations. Uh, we have lost our land, uh, as Wendell mentioned earlier. Uh, even in the already discriminated uh, world, uh, the violation of the rights to self-determinations will lead to even wider disparity between indigenous peoples and indige non-indigenous peoples in economic, education, jobs, access to public services, and etc. cetera. Um, environment, uh, environmental destructions are making us suffer. I call it from the sins of others because it's the government, it's the private companies who have violated our rights, who have taken our, our, our land, and if there is any floodings or contaminations with hazardous materials in our territory, then we are the one who suffers, not them. So that's why I call it the sins of others. We suffer that. Uh, and then we also see the uh, impact, especially on indigenous women and youth. And uh, as we know, youth is a uh, young generation is our future. And uh, I, I'm, we are all familiar with criminalizations of indigenous peoples that is still going on. And I think my brother, we, uh, Windel, has already mentioned that earlier uh, in his presentations. Uh, and also, I would like to share the lessons that we get from the ongoing global pandemic. Uh, it is very clear that indigenous peoples who have lost their land suffering the most and become the most threatened by the pandemic, by the by by the virus, and also by the crisis that follows the price uh, the the uh, virus, uh, the pandemic, which is food crisis. Um, it is very clear that indigenous peoples who maintain and manage ancestral land and resources are the most resilient, especially in food stock. So during this uh, crisis, we ask our indigenous community to make sure that they, uh, they check how much food do we have, how long are we gonna sustain with this kind of crisis? And the answer was very, uh, very uh, striking because some of them, they have six uh, months and even uh, years of uh, food stock available. Uh, we, we, it's very clear that it is not the private uh, companies or government who's taking care of us, but we really take care of ourselves and also others. And this is uh, this has been very uh, prominent uh, case cases among uh, indigenous peoples and also among the farmer uh, and also among the fisher folks. So we we are the one who's really taking care of uh, ourselves. Um, it is very clear that the current world economic structure is failed. Therefore, it is no longer feasible. It is it is unquestionable uh, that we cannot live with like like this anymore okay um so leading to that i would conclude by saying that we really um we need to have a new sustainable and just life together so uh, among indigenous peoples among others and we create the what so called uh, the global uh the global world the global community that is based on um uh, solidarity, uh, reciprocity, and respect. Um, I believe that we indigenous peoples uh, are the one actually who feed the world and can strengthen a global economy based on our system, our reciprocity, solidarity, and respect. Uh, but anyway, there are things that we need to do to ensure that, that we really 
uh, people have been talking about uh, economic uh, paradigm shift, but now is the time to really change uh, uh, dramatically our current economic uh, paradigms. As I mentioned earlier, evidence uh, saying that tell us that the current economic structure is no longer feasible. It's a total failure. Uh, and even though the government has spending a lot of money for them to bail them out, to give them all this privilege and, and taking away the money, public money for them, but they still cannot survive. Yeah, we've seen the countries that started to, uh, that have gone into recessions like Germany, uh, but uh, it is really uh, indigenous peoples that can uh, strengthen back, bring back the uh, global economy if uh, our rights are determinations. But for that, we need to have this uh, paradigm shift. We need to uh, paradigm shift that ensure the resiliency of indigenous peoples, allowing us to ensure the global resiliency at all aspects. And of course, government uh, has to have to recognize and fulfill and ensure and promote our rights as indigenous peoples, especially uh, rights of self-determinations. And I will always say big corporates back off. It, it is not your moment. It is not your time anymore. You have proven yourself uh, failed. Uh, but this is what we have to we have to be aware all the time because now, for example, in Indonesia, as the government uh, reconsider now revisiting the indigenous food, which is like sagu and cassava. Now the company is trying trying to uh, to to take the advantage, to take the uh, opportunity, and now they've been looking for a for a permits on sagu management, for example, and that that will again reinforce the already ongoing land grabbing. Uh, and violations of the rights of indigenous peoples. Um, we we need to have a really uh, self-determined development, self-determined development by indigenous peoples that uh, allow us to decide where do we do, where do we go, and how we are going to support ourselves and others. But for that, we need to have the full support for indigenous knowledge, traditions, and innovations. When we say we can we can feed the world, yeah, we can feed the humanity. We provide them food. What we have now is more like enough for us. So we need to find a way where we can fulfill that uh, duty for us. That we can provide more enough food for the world. Um, uh, I also we also believe that. We need to build a local to global resiliency mechanisms, including in crisis response mechanism. Uh, crisis response mechanism is so important also for indigenous peoples because I realized in Indonesia, because from the beginning we work, uh, we already have our cri uh, crisis uh, response uh, unit and protocols. Since the pandemic we've been working, we have 108 uh, groups of our uh, voluntaries working on the ground, taking care of indigenous peoples. And this work also allow us not just to see our how we are doing, how are our communities doing, and how do they have to respond, but that also shows that by by being on guard, by being alert, uh, being uh, be uh, doing the lockdown, what we call it in Amman lockdown, we close the gate and we check on all of our boundaries. That also uh, at some point prevents the new uh, land grabbings, and that's different with some other indigenous uh, peoples in other parts of the globe. That pandemic makes them more vulnerable, but we use this uh, moment to really go and stand guards, stand alert on our indigenous territories and especially on the boundaries. So I think this uh, crisis response mechanism will also allow, we will have to also include the, uh, the uh, how do we protect our, our, our land and territories. And I think that's, uh, that's from me. And therefore, in Amman, we already uh, refining our uh, future work, and we are going to base on what we call uh, uh, what we call uh, food sovereignty, and we coupled with economic strategy, indigenous economy uh, strategy, and we can share that in some other a uh, 
some other events later. I think that's from me, uh, Gam. Thank you so much, and I hope uh, I hope I'm clear, and I hope we will be able to discuss more on this later. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ruka, for the very interesting presentation and adding on to this uh, new addition, uh, other aspects of self-determination, focusing on the social economic aspect as well. I think that is very important. And uh, you have raised the aspect of how indigenous peoples can actually contribute to the national development and also global development, and that actually indigenous peoples are the major provider of food to the world. And uh, by recognizing our rights, uh, we can also settle a lot of the conflict that's all over in many parts of the world and reduce actually this cause of conflict settlement and so on. And in that, of course, you have proposed this sustainable life. And I think it's a very good way to end that we want to imagine a better new life with the wider society and with governments, but for that, indigenous peoples needs to be respected and the right to self-determination needs to be recognized so that we can also substantively contribute to a new vision where we have more sustainable and just uh, society with other peoples. No? So thank you, yeah. Ruka. <clears throat> now we will move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker is Govinda Chatiyal. He is the vice chairperson and in charge of foreign affairs of Nepal Federation of Indigenous Nationalities. He is also a governing council member of National Foundation for Development of Indigenous Nationalities and advisor of Nepal Chatyal Association, which is representative organization of the Chatyal Ind Indigenous peoples in Nepal. He is also serving as the focal person for Indigenous Peoples Network for, for SDGs in Nepal. Mr. Chatyal has been advocating and writing for Indigenous peoples and marginalized groups and continuously participating in Indigenous peoples movement uh, in various Indigenous peoples associations. He has also edited and authored half a dozen books and the recent one is called The Politics of Resistance, Indigenous Peoples and the Nepali State. So he is also a grassroots leader and has been in the forefront of advocating for the rights of Indigenous peoples in Nepal. <clears throat> he would be now speaking on the second topic of this session, that is, what does self-determination and self-government mean for indigenous peoples, as well as examining the rights of self-determination and indigenous peoples' self-conception of self-government. So Mr. Go uh, Gobin, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Looks like Mr. Gobin is having uh, some technical issues. Connection? Connection, I think. Uh, yeah. Bidai? Yeah. Bidai, can we go to you then while we try to sort out his internet connection? He messaged that they're having electricity problem. So apologies to everyone for that. Bidayak, can you hear me? Bidayak, can you unmute yourself?
विधायक विधायक कैन यू अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ विधायक All right. He was having trouble coming online uh, earlier on as well. He had informed that there there are technical challenges for him as well. So, um, Jenny, then would you be ready to switch uh, so that we can? <laughs> so, okay. Jenny has a presentation. Can we keep it on the line? And I will first introduce her. <clears throat> okay. Um, now then we will move on to Jenny while we sort out the technical problems with the other speakers. Um, Jenny Lasimbang is a Gadazan from Penampang, Sabah, Malaysia. Until the recent dissolution of the Sabah State Legislative Assembly, she was the representative for Kapayan and the Assistant Minister of Law and Native Affairs since May 2018. Jenny holds several posts, namely as the Sabah Women Chief, National Women Executive Committee Member, and uh, Central you know, Executive you know, Committee you know, Member. You know, so, you know, oh, sorry. Before joining <laughs> politics, can you mute him? Yeah, yeah. Before joining politics, Jenny was previously a member of the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And she was also the commissioner with the, uh, with the Malaysian Human Rights Commission and the Secretary General of Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact and the Indigenous Peoples Network of Malaysia. She also worked for 17 years as a grassroots trainer and organizer with Pakos Trust that is based in Sabah, Malaysia. So we're happy to welcome you, Jenny. If you are ready, let's start with your presentation. Thank you. The PowerPoint. For uh, allowing me this slot to, to speak very briefly. Um, I wish all our panelists, as well as our listeners, a uh, meaningful World Indigenous Peoples Day this year. So um, I'm going to speak very briefly on um, just uh, uh, on this uh, Indigenous Peoples Self Government. Um, what we, uh, this one is Bidayakta, <laughs> uh, the correct one earlier, sorry, uh, slide. But uh, while waiting for that, um, as we can hear, uh, as you had heard from Windel as well as uh, Ruka earlier, uh, it's uh, it's really one among the uh, experience we have uh, as indigenous peoples is facing great challenges and negotiation, uh, negotiating and implementing, or even sustaining and reforming self-government next uh, mm, uh, arrangement. So we we do have this. Uh, problem uh, whenever we have a discussion with states. We know what we want, but it's it's not so easy when we want to deal with our governments. So, but uh, as Ruka has uh, pointed out, the right to self-definition is already there. And, and thus, uh, when we talk about it, autonomy or self-government, uh, we should uh, consider this as our inherent right of indigenous people as recognized under the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And we don't actually need to uh, talk anymore about uh, how, uh, how to present our arguments and, and how states should be granting us the right to self-determination. Uh, uh, third slide, please. Um, I, because I, had the, I want to give this very good example uh, that we have found uh, in, the, in the US. Uh, next one. And uh, this, re, uh, this is related to the research conducted by the Harvard Project on American uh, Indian uh, on econ of economic development. Yeah, next one. Uh, next slides, please. And uh, through this, uh, earlier, <laughs> this is the third slide. Third slide. 
Okay, thank you. So the uh, shows, if you look at the, that project, they found that there is ample evidence uh, that economic development and self-sufficiency in Indian nations are closely linked to the presence of five uh, factors. So we're looking at uh, overall, no? and it's very interesting because I think uh, we can so show that these, uh, uh, they have a successful government because uh, even though I think in the past we've always heard that oh there's a lot of poverty and so on, but this is the positive things that we, we have looked in. And there are five uh, factors. One is the practical sovereignty, uh, effective governing institutions, cultural match, strategic orientation, and nation building uh, leadership. I'll go through one by one next. So um, this is what uh, the findings are practically. Uh, when we uh, talk about sovereignty, um, it is about taking over management of reservation affairs and resources, and also making major decisions about their own future. I think we, we heard earlier about how, uh, like Ruka was saying, looking at how our resources should be managed. And, and that is what we're talking about, practical sovereignty here. It's not just on paper, but actually talking about uh, management of affairs and resources. Secondly, is the effective governing institutions. So an um, uh, effective governing institution should have uh, these uh, four aspects, which is it has to be stable. And you have to separate it from day-to-day -day business and program management. And uh, the third one is having a fair and independent mechanism for dispute uh, resolution. This is often left out. We do programs, we do uh, various, we set up the institution, but we forget the dispute resolution. And the fourth is that uh, you provide uh, a bureaucracy that can get things done, not not the other way around, the, the bureaucracy or red tapes that uh, hinders us. So it has to be done reliably and effectively. Next. And uh, the other, uh, the third one is that having in uh, this governance institution, we have to be culturally matched, meaning it has to be culturally appropriate to those indigenous peoples. So all the institutions, the mechanisms, the laws, policies, and procedures have to be based on indigenous people's own culture, cultural values. And, uh, and so, in having this, then it will be legitimate in the eyes of, of people. I think not just by uh, government, but also by indigenous, especially indigenous peoples themselves. The fourth one is to have a strategic orientation. We, we do not want to be uh, baggage, but in fact, we want to say, we have to think about not just talking about how much money I'm going to do, who's going to control, but really what kind of society are we trying to build? So we have to talk from that side. Um, orientation helps to shift the focus from short term to the long term and from responding to crisis and opportunities to implementing a communities or people's vision. I think that's really important. And uh, finally, uh, next slide, please, is uh, and in, in this uh, leadership. With regards to uh, leadership, we have to be public spirited and, and nation building. So leadership should focus on developing effective government institutions, transforming government into a mechanism for advancing uh, our national objectives. So um, again, uh, mine was supposed to be a very short remark. So, so I just wanted to share this because it's not all bad news. We can have news that uh, uh, in, in which we are, uh, you know, our negotiating uh, uh, efforts will be more positive. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Jenny. I think there was very clear and precise and concrete points for us to consider, as you rightly said, that it is not the time anymore to be arguing that indigenous peoples have the legitimate right to self-determination. But it is time to actually focus on the kind of framework that we should be looking at that can help to really realize meaningful self-governance and self-determination for indigenous peoples. And I think you have presented a very concrete uh, five points for us to look at uh, in order for us to be able to move forward. 
I'm sure that there would be many questions coming to you perhaps as well. So let's wait for the session. So thank you very much, Jenny. <laughs> now let's go back to our other two uh, panelists. Um, it just shows how challenging it is for us in terms of infrastructure, technology, things like that uh, in our indigenous areas. But nevertheless, we wanted to have speakers in the balanced way from other countries as well, uh, so that we are regionally balanced. Now, I will go back to Mr. Uh, Gobind. Um, um, I have already introduced you, but I will just say that currently he is a vice chair of the Nepal Federation of Indigenous Nationalities. So Gobin will speak on the second topic. That is, what does self-determination and self-government mean for indigenous peoples? Examining the right of self-determination and indigenous people's conception of self-government. So Mr. Gobin, please go ahead with your presentation. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Gam. Uh, sorry for internet, internet uh, fluctuation. Uh, thank you, moderator and secretary general, Mr. Gam, and entire AIPP team for this important session. Respected panelists, indigenous sisters and brothers, namaste to all. On behalf of the Nepal Federation of Indigenous Nationalities, NEFIN, and Nepal's indigenous peoples, thank you for joining me here today at this weighty session. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the great antecedents and ancestors of indigenous peoples who kept protecting our civilization, history, and identity, even in complex and difficult situations. And to the indigenous peoples of this era who have been waging a difficult struggle for self-determination, and self-government in the hope of a bright future. I wish you all the happy 26th International Day for, day for the old indigenous peoples. As we know, self-determination and the self-government is the prime agenda with the whole view of indigenous peoples. The right to self-determination is the inherent and in alienable rights of indigenous people. It is not the matter of giving or taking. In the context of Nepal, self-government is fundamental agenda of indigenous people because why it is concerned with the emancipation from the hierarchical, hierarchical, hierarchical caste-based system of Nepal, which is closely similar with the colonization. Indigenous peoples of Nepal has been suffering since 250 years after Gorkha expansion. After the so-called unification, Hindu caste groups who are power holders called the Bhavan Chetri, dominance to indigenous peoples through displacements from their lands, territories, and their natural resources. Displacement from their exercising pol political, social, cultural, and legal rights, and so on. Secondly, it is important for us to govern ourselves and to exercise political, social, cultural, legal rights, customary practices by ourselves. Self-government can also be a remedial measure for the past historical discrimination. Indigenous peoples want to live with dignity and with sovereign equal power in their lands and territories. Let us dis discuss in simple way. There are two kinds of human rights. One is individual and another is collective rights. Human rights are not merely individual, but also collective rights. Individual rights are for everyone, both indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. But by virtue of being indigenous peoples, having distinct identity and having a collective rights, indigenous peoples refer to rights to self-determination, autonomy, self-rule, rights over lands, territories, ownership and control over resources, continuity of customary laws and customary institutions, right to language or mother tongue, etc. All are interconnected, which is primarily concerned with the self-governance system. Self-determination has connection with the right to make one's own decisions how on how to make a living. 
Therefore, right to self-determination has two aspects. As a point, right to self-determination has two sides. One is consent and other side is control. The free prior informed consent means within the indigenous land, territories and resources, any outsider either legally or administratively undertakes any activities that may directly or indirectly harm to indigenous peoples prior to everybody prior to anybody undertakes or things free prior informed consent must be maintained with the indigenous peoples the other side is control the control means here particular indigenous communities have right to make decision with language to speak what religion to follow what rituals from birth to death to follow or and not to follow what the what dress to wear what tradition to continue and what not the respective community has right to make collective decision those matters therefore indigenous peoples need control over their life does this control aspect is also right to self-determination if there is no consent right to determination has no meaning so as if there is no control it has no meaning the day when the indigenous peoples are able to exercise control and consent they are deemed to have exercised right to self determination what i want to talk about is the nature self government what sort of development the indigenous peoples are looking for they have to give on the right to make decision of that development if there is western approach of development western approach of development so as there is so as there is another approach of the hindu so called high caste bound in Nepal, which is an idea for them, own race, own culture, own religion, own language. The real development is that, which is based on self-determination and self-government. In Nepal, there is still a life in some indigenous territories that they decide they, everything based on their customary laws by their representative chosen through their own process relating to lands, territory resources they have full control over management of them including their living which we find even today that is example of exercising the right to self-determination indigenous peoples either they are tharu through burger or valmansa or motowa newas through buthi gurungs through nalsaba tamangs through gamba limbus through chumlung mongas through veja yolmo through yulkim Hakali through Tera Mukia system, Dimal through Maji Warang or Maji through Maji Saba, whatever they are doing through such customary institution, one example of exercising what they mean is right to deal self determination, which is related to lands, territories, and resources. If indigenous peoples do not have to have full control and ownership over lands, territories, and resources, there is not meaning to self determination and self government system. Based on, based on above, mention premises any form of self-government for indigenous people should not be limited only to political structure but also to their collective control protection management and utilizations of their lands and resources autonomous politics structure for indigenous peoples to exercise exercise the rights to self-determination there should be recognitions of indigenous political system as an alternative system for the promotions of the collective interest and welfare of indigenous people. I always surprised when I used to attend, attend different meetings, seminars, sessions, dialogues organized by straight mechanism, development partners, etc. I feel the challenges that the remain for this right to self-determination and self-government. In fact, as you in fact, as you will see shortly, the debate is currently delicately posed and may even be heading towards consensus on the issues of recognition of a right to self-determination for indigenous people. Indigenous peoples want to live freely and equality with other segments of the society. The self-government is basically recognition of the spiritual connection of indigenous peoples to their traditional lands, territories, and resources. The need for recognition of the continuing existence of distinct systems of law and governance there has been a significant narrowing in the lines of dispute about the right to self-determination as it implies applies to indigenous peoples this debate i have in my view moved from 
being focused on whether indigenous peoples have a right to self-determination to now focusing on the nature and extent of indigenous people's right to self-determination. This is not to say that it is not still contention. Recognition of self-determination and self-government is a vital step in the legal process of decolonizing the relationship between indigenous peoples and the state. Some indigenous people see the attempts to impose qualif qualifications of territorial integrity as leading instead to their recolonization or as limiting recognition of their sovereign rights as indigenous nations. What, what remains to be seen is whether this logic is enough for those states who remain concerned to ensure that there is absolutely no misunderstanding about the effect on their political unity and territorial integrity of the recognition of the right of self-determination for indigenous peoples. I would argue that more explicit text is unnecessary from an international law perspective. But as indigenous peoples have known and stayed for a long time, this process is own that is primarily about the politics and not the law. And I think it is a politics of decolonization, a new version of a process that to date has not been applied to indigenous peoples. This is the context. This is the context in which the upcoming struggle for self-government of indigenous peoples will take place. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Govindji, for pointing out some very important and interesting points that we should all be considering. Uh, some of the important ones that you have pointed out is that consent is one aspect of our self-determination when it comes to uh, development and resource uh, extraction, you know, and also the control aspect of our lands, land territories and resources. Now, also I think what you have pointed out in a very succinct way is that the struggle for self-determination should not be looked upon as a threat to the state. That is in terms of breaking up the political unity of the Nepal, uh, uh, Nepal state and also of territorial disintegration, you know? but it is more about social and cultural uh, transformation of some contradictions that may be there in the Nepal society. That's in terms of life, for example, caste hierarchies and so on. And in all these self-determination, the issue of spirituality, the issue of customary institutions and customary law is absolutely crucial. And that is what indigenous peoples in Nepal are emphasizing when you're talking about your right to self-determination. I think those are very uh, crucial points. So, Govin, thank you very much for that uh, excellent presentation. Now, let's move to the last speaker of this session. Uh, the last speaker is Vidhayak Chakma. He is a lawyer and indigenous rights activist who belongs to Juma peoples from Chitawong Hill Tracks, Bangladesh, and currently working for Barpatia Chattagram Janas uh, Samhati Samiti as the Assistant Secretary for Youth Affairs. Being a hardcore activist, he has been working with dedication at local, national, and international levels for the protection and promotion of the rights of indigenous peoples, especially focusing on the rights of indigenous Juma peoples of the Chittagong Hill Tracks. At domestic level and international levels, he has taken part in different campaigns, networking, meetings, trainings, conferences, and workshops, including uh, different meetings and site events of the United Nations. Uh, so, Mr. Bidayak will be speaking on the same topic, that is the second topic, on what does self-determination and self-government mean for indigenous peoples? Examining the rights of self-determination and indigenous peoples' conception of self-government. So, Mr. Bidayak, please take your time.
Looks like he is having a bad day with the internet. This is this is communication uh, disparity, digital divide. Okay, I um, Okay, he's trying to come online. Let's just give him a few more seconds. Can you hear me? Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, sorry for uh, the, all the challenges. I'm so sorry. Anyway, <clears throat> thank you, Gam. Um, <laughs> and uh, thank you, um, AIPP. Can you just screen my presentation, please? So that I can follow my presentation. Hello. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, Thank you, Gam, again, and I thank also AIPP um, uh, for uh, just making a uh, room for me. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Actually, you, you see, I'm still actually facing lots of challenges, and I have got cold, and so I'm sorry if I cough and I make any inconvenience to all of you. Um, on the eve of International Day of All Indigenous Peoples, and in the pandemic harsh time, um, I would like to just extend my love and solidarity uh, to all of you uh, from our Jumo people of, of Chidewong Health Race. So, um, okay, uh, I, uh, you have already, um, I, uh, I mean, crossed our time. So let's go to the main agenda, please. The next slide, please. Um, we are talking actually with Govindoji and me. Uh, we are responsible to actually explore two um, uh, two conception. I mean the indigenous people uh, conception on the self determination and self governments. So, for me, when I actually think about self determination as an indigenous person, what I think, I think we are a proud and thriving. The vibrant uh, community that um, in our own land, that is, we are the community and we are in the own land, and we, of course, with our unique cultural identity and unique way of life. And of course, we are proud of our this uniqueness. And the second thing is, we are the we community people, or our community is in, in charge to decide our direction or our destiny and it, without any outside interference. That's the actually um, core understanding of self-determination. The term self-determination itself actually self-explaining. Self means for indigenous people, indigenous people themselves and determination, of course, they determine for themselves whatever they need and whatever they want. That's the actually um concept uh from from the uh, context of indigenous people i think okay next slide please <clears throat> so um in terms of indigenous people concepts on our self governments um it is actually linked to a very uh inseparably interlinked with the concept of self-determination when we say as the our uh based on self-determination we decide what we want we decide our destiny our direction that is we govern ourselves we rule ourselves that is we have such own government or self-government so every government has its um uh, some laws or rule or regulation uh, to run it so what about our self-government i mean indigenous uh, government system i mean based on which actually 
uh, which rule or laws our government system is run. I say it's run based on our the uh, values of our society or our community. So um, in the concept of the self-government, uh, one thing we should be very clear that um, uh, in the understanding of this concept, I say it has to be understood uh, beyond the autonomy that's offered or guaranteed in the current state structure. Sometimes we understand, okay, uh, self governments, uh, that's it only, uh, it might be the guaranteed or offered in the state, current state uh, structure. But I say you, you have to understand it uh, beyond, beyond the uh, state or uh, state structure. Because before, before the uh, emergence of the state, even there were indigenous people, of course, and they had, the, uh, they had self-determination, they had self governance So next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, in terms of indigenous people's governments, I, um, I was talking about the values of our community. So what's our value? Our values is communitarianism. And I say, of course, it's a, it's a human a value of humanity. So in um, our total, if we look at our uh, indigenous society, I say collectiveness is the core of the indigenous society. That with their collectiveness, community people are deeply connected to each other. And in their everyday life, they collective, uh, collectively participate in making decisions and even implementing those uh, decisions. Therefore, the self-government is real highly democratic. democratic. So it's, it's my idea. I mean, uh, we, uh, okay, let's see also some example, our next slide, please. <clears throat> some uh, values, what ex uh, exact, uh, exactly we understand in practical life in our indigenous society. What's our, what are our values? Uh, our values actually are manifested in, in uh, different practices and everyday life. For instance, I say um, community ownership on the land and natural resources. Even uh, community ownership over some of our say, uh, indigenous uh, design or even music and uh, medicine, actually, and etc. Most of our resources or our property, what's that, actually, are under our community ownership. Uh, and in the call, um, of course, we have to um, practice collective decision like in using the community land. For example, in uh, my community, when I <clears throat> say, for example, in a specific some village, villagers actually sit and they talk and decide uh, which um, part or um, should be allotted and sweet parts of the village is should be uh, cultivated as uh, our shifting cultivation or junk cultivation. So, and another, some uh, I say it's also not only uh, general as uh, democracy or collectiveness or practice, it's a uh, uh, practice of humanity and care. Um, the example is like collective voluntary help to travel family. I mean, in, in in the village, some uh, any uh, family is in travel for whatever reason, maybe sickness or whatever reason. Then people actually um, villager they help together. Uh, to, uh, we in our Chakma community we call it Malayi. And uh, another example is like um, uh, if, if there is a mother for newborn in the village, we usually what we do. Um, our uh, uh, villager actually. Um, offer some very uh, delicious food or some nutritious food. There is a very a special care for the new ma uh, mothers of newborns uh, in, a, in practice in our society. Then also, of course, there's a special care for our senior people. For example, uh, in our, um, uh, the biggest uh, social uh, festival like Biju or the Sankran, uh, yeah, usually what we do, we go um, uh, to the senior people and we uh, just um, uh, they clean up with a body or uh, uh, and like that. So we is uh, we have some practice actually to care the new uh, mothers and I mean women and senior people. And this is all the our um, uh, values of our society. And based on these values, actually, our self, um, our indigenous self government are run. 
So it's really democratic, really as a so human at show caring, I, I say. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so, okay, as we are um, talking about um, self-determination and self-government, um, but, uh, and I say, okay, we have to understand self-government uh, beyond the state structure. But in reality, uh, as uh, Zaini and others uh, actually speaker uh, mentioned, that um, in concrete reality, actually, uh, actually, indigenous peoples are part of the current state. So uh, their self-government uh, system also uh, have to some, to some extent, I have to understand uh, in that state structure. And I'm taking just uh, as an example, our Chittagong Health Rex Accord uh, that offers some uh, regional uh, uh, self-government system. So next slide, please. <clears throat> um, it's, um, um, most of, many of you know about our CST Accord uh, because it, um, it was signed uh, some uh, 24 years ago. And uh, the uh, accord was actually um, um, signed uh, to resolve the CST problem. It's a political problem, uh, we, we say, and it's a national problem of Bangladesh. And uh, key features are like, uh, is a demilitarizing the CHD and to protect the land rights of the Yuma people, and also uh, to protect and preserve the tribal inhabited characteristics of the region, and a sponsor administration system with the apex for the original council and three hill district and so on. So um, it is our uh, it, it is a key uh, uh, key uh, our power that's uh, um, ensure in the in the accord for the uh, indigenous uh, Duma people. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so, but what's the reality um, uh, in terms of implementation of the CST Accord? I will already say, I mentioned that core issues of the CST Accord remain unimplemented after even some 24 years. So CST remain under military rule. Now, uh, and uh, still there's a military rule. And very currently, um, the government actually what did as a did just opposite again and, and against this year implementation of CST account. It actually criminalized any activities of implementation process or implementation activities of CST account. And even um, it has criminalized our democratic movement of PCJS, which is one of the signatory party of the uh, of the account. You know, but in the pandemic time where people and the uh, nation to nation, people to people are actually taking care, um, <clears throat> are taking care. But in our CST, the reality, the military atrocities intensify in the pandemic time. That they're actually using against um, uh, against the Juma people as an opportunity to uh, silence our voices. So it, it, it is the reality. So uh, the common Juma people, PCJS PC activists, are the regularly at the victim of this uh, intensified of the at military atrocities. Ne ne next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, before going to final word, what I just say, that is uh, over here, I am at the democratic country like Bangladesh, they are claiming that Bang Bangladesh is a one of democratic country. They can actually learn and they can be benefited from the concept of our um, uh, uh, government system of indigenous people. That's really highly democratic, first of all. And then, <clears throat> on the other hand, I think Bangladesh government has really very um, a good opportunity uh, to be, uh, uh, to, to um, uh, what to prove itself as a democratic a state or democratic government by uh, implementing GST Act. Why? Why I'm saying that? Because you see, See, Tegong Health Tech is that one ten part of whole Bangladesh. So if your arms or one organ of your body is paralyzed, you can't claim yourself as a um, sound health. So if you remain your one ten part, Chitagong Health Tech under military rule, militarized, you cannot say that Bangladesh is a, is a good democratic, con uh, democratic country or there's a democratic rule. So Pacito Health Tax is not um, even the outside of the Bangladesh. It is the one ten part of Bangladesh. So it is really uh, Bangladesh government has a, um, a good opportunity 
uh, to um, uh, to a, you know, I mean, enhance its democratic system or democratic rule by implementing GSTI code and respect the uh, indigenous people rights. So final words say, okay, or we have to, we indigenous people, we have to in church and we have to preserve and protect our uh, values. That's precious uh, treasures, I say, for, uh, our, of our indigenous people. So for our survival and <clears throat> for our existence, indigenous people, uh, we have to continue our fight to uphold our self-determination. I say self-determination is not a matter of begging. It's a matter of our own uh, treasures, own things. So we are the masters of arms, us. So, and it and I say, in terms of upholding our uh, self-determination, we have to uh, continue our fight. And in, in advancing our movement, we must embrace our ways for ways any form of struggle that the time and given situation demand, I say. So it's actually um, the conception uh, from my side uh, regarding the um, self-determination and self-government. And it is the, from our uh, practical uh, or reality uh, in the context of CST of uh, what the challenges I have just shared. So it's all uh, solidarity to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vidayak Chakma, for that presentation. We know from your presentation that after 24 years of signing the accord, the CHD accord, it has still not been implemented. So this is the story of the reality of how we are dealing with our governments. So it reflects the untrustworthiness and the repressive nature of the state that we're experiencing. And also, of course, you have stressed the importance of how community bonds together and their value systems and how communities share and particularly the aspect of collective rights and how we do things collectively together which is often one of the missing aspects when we look at this present democratic modern system. And I uh, take it that that's one of the points that you were stressing in terms of the self-conception of our right to self-determination, uh, self-government by indigenous uh, peoples. Now, we are running short of time. And I think it will not be fair if we don't give the time for questions to the uh, audience. So what I will do is I will pick up already some of the questions that has come in from the participants. And then also some of the questions uh, that I think maybe will help in understanding this topic from the moderator will be posed uh, in a random way with different speakers. Um, so I would like to uh, start this with uh, Jenny Lasimbang. The question uh, is that, Jenny, you have shared concrete aspects of how self-government of indigenous peoples could be actualized uh, within the state system. For example, you have mentioned about the effective governing institutions for indigenous peoples, cultural match, public-oriented leadership, et cetera. How do you think that we can begin to engage with Asian governments, particularly in Malaysia, in envisioning social and economic development through strong governance of indigenous peoples uh, with our respective governments in the near future? Yeah. Um... Thank you, Gem, and uh, thank you to all the panelists because I think it also gives us an idea how they are engaging, and I think it gives already the strong um, basis. Um, so I think that's how it will have to start. If there are agreements, there are existing agreements. Uh, for example, in in Sabah, uh, within Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak have this Malaysia agreement uh, in 1963 when Sabah and Sarawak and Singapore at that time. Uh, form Malaysia, uh, 
so we came up with an agreement. So in the same way, like the CHT Accord, and uh, as we heard, have heard, um, we need to start with that. And to me, uh, what's important is also if there is already those uh, aspects in our current constitution, uh, that would be the basis. Um, for example, in, in Sabah, we already said that 40% uh, uh, of the resources uh, should be uh, that is collected or from uh, from the from Malaysia uh, from from Sabah should go back, and we know that uh, funds are a major aspect of our discussion here. But uh, as I said earlier, the five aspects um, is really giving this the that particular indigenous territory or even the state where uh, majority of indigenous peoples come from um, this practical sovereignty. Uh, in the case of Sabah, we talk about um, you know, education, health, these are like a joint uh, in, the, in the constitution, uh, schedule, uh, nine schedule, it's already there that this will be a joint or uh, co-managed co together. So these are the things that you must uh, allow uh, the Sabah, for example, to, to de define itself and determine what kind of uh, education, what kind of health, because we know it better. And in terms of the cultural match, um, we have tourism and uh, this, uh, the, you know, we want to make sure that uh, culture, or the Sabahan culture is, uh, is uh, portrayed. In the same way, I think in all the other states, we talk about uh, the governments, we talk about this as well. And in many places, we talk about the sustainable development, sustainable agriculture. Yet, you know, we are in many um, government, um, I fight this, all the time regarding uh, budgets. Um, subsistence economy works for indigenous peoples. They, uh, the terrain is suitable, for example, in Sabah. Yet, I think uh, sustainable development and uh, agriculture is not recognized. It's still seen as uh, negatively, although I think the work that AIPP has done over the last uh, you know, decade has really proved that to be very useful. Um, as, well, as far as leadership is concerned, um, in the political scheme of things, um, if you have national uh, political organization like, like where I'm coming from now, the fact that uh, they consciously allow uh, more uh, decisions coming from uh, our state leaders from Sabah to make those decisions, to make sure that uh, when we talk about nation building, uh, the, the ideas, the concepts of, of people coming from um, uh, the leadership, uh, our leadership from Sabah is is included. Uh, indigenous leadership is so important in in nation building. Yet we are always uh, looked down upon. That's why I think uh, is uh, particularly uh, going to a last uh, point here is particularly excited uh, for us, uh, exciting for us now because the there is a can, candidate for prime minister coming from Sabah and we were very supportive of our chief minister uh, uh, when it was uh, announced by the prime minister uh, Mahadir Muhammad um, that uh, he is the candidate uh, for prime, next prime minister and I think it captures the dream for uh, a Malaysian uh, coming from Sabah. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, and good luck with the preparation for the IP candidate for the Prime Minister. <laughs> um, okay, talking about election, this is a question to Ruka and Bidayak. I'm just trying to connect this response from Jenny and then to this following question. So Ruka and Bidayak, how should indigenous peoples move forward Having been so used to governance system that is based on elections, bureaucracy, judiciary, and economic, that's a uh, dominant system. How do we integrate collective and economic aspects to maintain and retain indigenous sovereignty? So, Ruka, would you like to go first and followed by Bidayak? <clears throat> Yeah, thank you very much, Gam. This is really uh, indeed a very um, uh, challenging question, but I think 
uh, us as indigenous peoples, we shouldn't be, um, we should, should retrain our, uh, refrain ourselves from discussing a broad range of issues that uh, are very relevant and all are relevant to uh, our life and our very existence as indigenous peoples. Uh, when we talk about uh, politics, how do uh, how will the uh, indigenous uh, people's uh, politics uh, in terms of when we talk about about the democracy, as our democracy as indigenous peoples is always based on the collective decision making. There is no one man one foot. Uh, the unfortunately we are now living in the uh, mainstream uh, democratic uh, system that is based on one uh, man, one foot. How do we how do we overcome that? Again, it's also uh, going back to ourselves uh, as indigenous peoples. Uh, what we have experienced, what we have exercised in uh, Amman in since 2007, what we call uh, expanding the political uh, participations of indigenous peoples, where we realize uh, we indigenous peoples uh, under under the constructions of a uh, political system and policy making processes of the modern nation state, we are always left out. Uh, while actually everything decided there in the public policy making processes is all about our life. And we always say that uh, nothing about us without us. Uh, therefore, some because we've been always left out in the public uh, decision making processes because they're all um, because they're, they're all uh, so much dominated by by the national leaders then um, all the decisions made are actually made that intentionally to grab our land and uh, to grab everything from us so the indigenous uh, land grabbing over the year, years, uh, over the century, over, over the over decades since uh, the foundations of this all uh, modern nation state are actually legally they do it based on the legal uh, uh, and the policy. So in accordance to the legal and policy, they have the rights to take over our land. Therefore, we cannot stay like that anymore. We have to be able to go there and make sure that our leaders are, are better equipped, yeah? A better equipped to go there and also uh, going and make decisions uh, that any decision that will, that will eventually uh, impact our life directly. And uh, I, I, I want to refer to the, uh, the movement of our sisters and brothers in Sabah because that's very much uh, in line with us. And in Amman, because of our expand, our political participations of our leaders uh, since 2007, we are able now to, uh, to adopt, to adopt the uh, local regulations on the recognitions of indigenous uh, peoples. It's more than 100 now. Uh, and those are the areas where actually we can intervene because we are very close. We are, that's where the close, the close, the most close one to our uh, reality as indigenous peoples, especially indigenous communities. Um, we also have, set, uh, have a, a mechanism where we combine our decision making, our democracy, collective uh, decision making process with one man, one votes through uh, again the community assembly. So when we going to uh, when we going to uh, this is this is very uh, very um, uh, how you call it a very detailed and very complicated, but it is doable because. We need to decide who first they have to have legitimacy. They have to have mandates, uh, mandates from the community. Who are the leaders that community uh, wants to send become to become the politicians, to become the public uh, decision uh, makers. And but for that, we need to decide first within ourselves. And then when we decide, we go all out and help them. Uh, not just during the elections, but also after the election, because after the election is the most dangerous part. If we don't have mechanisms to directly control, control our 
uh, control our uh, politicians, our indigenous politicians, they will fall into the cracks. They will trap into the corrupt system. So that's that's uh, that's one of the aspects that I think all of us indigenous peoples will have to also consider. Uh, we also have some experience from other indigenous peoples from different country who run uh, to the parliament's uh, seats, for examples, but since the very weak uh, control from the constituents, from the community, and also from indigenous organizations, those are the ones who then missing in in missing in mission on mission. Yeah, the intention is great, but the structure, the mechanism to ensure that they will go on the right direction is not in place. That is uh, that is very very important, and I think by there, if we have better uh, better. Uh, uh mm -hmm. policies at local levels at local levels we actually can already bring that pressure up into the national level uh so i think uh that is very uh and that's that's the practice of aman since 2007 it is not easy but always it is doable because this is something very new to us very um alien to us but unfortunately we are forced to follow so how do we how do we make that uh, these two two completely different uh, democratic uh, system and find a way how do we make sure because in aman we are not uh, we still don't have mandate to build our own uh, political parties why because we realize the current political party system is so corrupt and we will be uh, swollen the whole movement will be swollen up by 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 the system if we establish uh establish our own political party so that's uh that's uh, from us now and leaders on the village level uh we also have that we we were it's uh, i remember uh, once uh, uh dr mirna Cunningham said life will be easier if we are in control that is very true life uh, our decisions uh will determine our life and our life is our decisions i think it's 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 so important to really think of this how do we make sure because this is our country anyway this is our land anyway this is our decisions and i think um uh, that's that's something i want to share uh with uh, from from indonesia and especially now during these uh situations yeah during this uh, crisis uh the we i mean it's it's out of questions it's 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 that we need the new order yeah the new life and where indigenous peoples really uh, uh can play a bigger role a major role fundamental role uh, because we in the end we are the one who will who will support the earth and and, and also the humanity and um and especially in our own community there is no others who have a more a interest than us on our own land that's why we need to take care of ourselves but uh, most importantly also because we are in the time of uh, celebrating the uh, international day of the world's indigenous peoples these are the things that we need to bring back uh, into our life as indigenous peoples and community and organizations to really think where do we go now from now what are the options and we open our 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 mind and our heart and see how do we do we, we decide our options our pathway our traject trajectories and we really run with it yeah so i think that's uh that's from me now and i would like to say uh, uh happy uh, international day of the world indigenous peoples our sisters and brothers everywhere and we also have uh, events here in indonesia so if you are uh are a join because indigenous peoples we are ready and on the ninth we will see um virtually how indigenous peoples are, are prepared really to face what we call the new order the new life so that's uh thank you very much again and jenny always and uh govinda hi and also a uh, thank you to secretary general of eipp for making these uh things happen thank you so much Yes, thank you, uh, Ruka. Bidayat, would you also like to come in briefly on the same question? I'm actually, sorry, I missed a question because of my technical problem. Can you just repeat a little bit? 
Okay, the question is, how should indigenous peoples move forward? Having been so used to governance system that is based on election, bureaucracy, judicial and economic system, that's basically the state system. So how can we retain or get back to our indigenous political sovereignty? Can you be very brief so that we have time for more questions? Okay. Would you Thank like you. To um, for me, actually, I have already mentioned in my presentation, I think uh, the, um, I'm sure a little bit cover uh, of this question. I mean, yes, um, when we are talking about uh, they are very, <clears throat> um, our very nature of the self-determination and self-government, we have to think it beyond the state structure. That's the question. But I say, but the reality is that, but in the, we have to think, uh, understand it in practice in the state structure. So uh, in, within the state structure, I, uh, I say, it also vary. So if you compare with some, say, Greenland, so home rule, and our CST accord, uh, the regional, uh, regional autonomy, it's a far more different. So uh, when we are talking about the realization of our own self administration or self government uh, in the state st structure, or what's best say uh, in the uh, election process or ordinary election um, uh, culture, that is, um, we we have to be part of the total state structure. It's a reality, but it's depending on. Um, they, uh, or the can state itself and the indigenous people they themselves that that's a uh, reality I think it's so very thank you <clears throat> okay thank you Vidayak now I would like to pose this next question to Windell I hope Windell you are still online Windell the question is from the participants it says, share your views on the view of Cordillera uh, peoples on Bangsa Moro. I don't know if I'm pronouncing correctly, Bangsa Moro. Does the Bangsa Moro peace process have any implications for indigenous peoples? Can you respond briefly? Um, hello? Hello, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the ongoing uh, uh, peace process, which has been uh, going on for several decades, uh, on the uh, Bangsamoro question or Bangsamoro right to self-determination. Yeah, uh, and, uh, until now, uh, the uh, Moro people in Mindanao are not yet enjoying the right to self-determination uh, you must have uh, uh, learned and heard of the news uh, during uh, the earlier uh, period of the Duterte administration when uh, the government and the armed forces of the Philippines basically bombarded the Islamic city of Malawi so while uh, there is this um, so-called uh, Bangsamoro uh, agreement uh, on the ground the uh, Moro people are uh, being victimized and, and the attacks against the Moro people are, uh, have intensified. And as I mentioned a while ago, one very clear uh, example of this was the bombing and destruction of the Islamic city of uh, Malawi and Mindanao, uh, which is why until now, uh, it's not only the indigenous peoples in the Cordillera or the, across the country that is being victimized or be whose rights to self-determination are violated, but also the rights of the uh, Bangsamoro. Now about the uh, recognition of the uh, Bangsamoro right to self-determination, there is this continuing dialogue between uh, indigenous peoples and uh, the Bangsamoro on how to collaborate and uh, help one another and uh, for its uh, side, uh, the rights and uh, aspirations to be respected not just on the right to self-determination and culture, but also on territories and the uh, ancestral land. So uh, until now, that is not yet uh, uh, very clear. So it's still uh, a long, long struggle uh, for uh, both the uh, Moro people and the indigenous peoples in Mindanao, like the Lomads, 
whose rights also, especially under the authority regime, has been systematically um, violated up to now, uh, more so when the Duterte government imposed martial law in Mindanao for, uh, for a year and uh, until now, such martial law, the bombing of uh, Marawi City, and the uh, political attacks against uh, indigenous peoples and uh, the Bangsamoro people have not uh, resolved uh, peace and uh, the recognition of uh, indigenous peoples and Moro peoples' right to self-determination. Our uh, uh, recommendation is for the Bangsamoro and the indigenous peoples in Mindanao to unite on the basis of their common problem and common struggle for self-determination. Thank you, uh, Windell, for the concise response. Now the next question is for uh, Govind. You have stressed that the right to self-determination of indigenous peoples should not cause misunderstanding in terms of posing threats to, to political unity and territorial integrity of the state of Nepal. And you have also stated that indigenous system would contribute to alternative political vision. Can you elucidate further on what is this alternative political vision that you are talking about and which you should be in dialogue with the government as well as the larger society in Nepal? What is this alternative political vision that you are talking about? Uh, uh, thank you, Giam, for important concern or question. This is also a challenge, challenging question. Uh, as we know, indigenous government system is based on collective principle. Bidaik also already discussed, and the Ruka also, and Zeni also, Windel also, all are talking about the collectiveness, control. Uh, so, the basically the Western concept of democracy is prevailing like in Nepal, which is not fully self-determined governing system at all. Euro-Western political framework, I'm talking about it, is always conflicting with indigenous governing system. Similarly, for example, we can talk, ordi or ordinal legal system, always contradictory with the customary legal system of indigenous peoples. What I am talking, the concern of you, the concern of your um, uh, valuable or uh, query, it means that the ability of existing political system or institutions for indigenous peoples of Nepal has been less effective to resolve, mediate or mitigate discrimination based on language, culture, or so many things we can talk. And it is not able to ensure justice, rule of law, from the perspective of indigenous peoples, etc. And Nepal is suffering. I already talked about it in my presentation. Nepal is suffering from caste-based hierarchical society, which is vertical top down pure and impure but, the system, but this existing political system has not been able to abolish since long time these kinds of hierarchical hierarchical society discrimination pure and impure but the self governance system for me from my perspective can contribute because because sorry because it believes horizontal rather than vertical based on 
base rather than vertical. Why I am talking about it? It is based on the empirical experiences of the indigenous peoples, the values, and we can talk about in second side, based on the alternative political idea, the values and ideas of self-government is principally, yes, Vidayak mentioned clearly about the communitarianism, communi communitarianism and the humanity, the values of self-government of the indigenous people. So it is, it is not the concept of the falsely imposed by the power, by the uh, state mechanisms. This is based on the community's more values, ground realities. Therefore, self-government system can be alternative political vision. To equally respect and recognize all kinds of peoples and the perspective. Uh, this is my uh, intervention regarding your questions, Gam, and thank you for opportunity and thank you all. Thank you, Gobinji. I think we are now almost out of time. So we will end this session by a question coming from the audience. I think it is very good to end it this way. Um, the question is to all the panelists, in the context of rise in right-wing nationalism, xenophobia and racism in many countries, what can we learn from the core values of indigenous peoples? in resisting this trend by promoting governance that is led by inclusivity and equality. So what can we learn from the core values of indigenous peoples? I would like to give one minute each to all the panelists. I can just call up one by one and then we can conclude. First, I think uh, let's start from Vidayak as the last speaker of, uh, in the first round. Vidayak, can you please just take your time, one minute? Vidayak? Okay, he's disconnected, so... Um, Okay, then let's uh, go to uh, Winda. Uh, the, uh, the question is uh, very interesting. The reason why in, in my uh, presentation a while ago, because uh, indigenous peoples now clearly, they are, they are already experts on what is self-determination, democracy, they are experts on what they want and what should be the society or government that indigenous people should be in. The question now is how... Hello? Yeah, please continue. It's Bidaya. We're having too much problem there. Yeah, continue. Uh, the question now... The, uh, the, the, the question now is how to make this a reality in our own communities, in our own uh, territories. Now, with regards to the rise in right-wing nationalism, xenophobia, racism, I think one fundamental uh, uh, component or framework that we should do, uh, consider is that indigenous peoples are not just indigenous peoples per se as a people or distinct people but they are also, uh, they, also belong, they also belong to various democratic classes and sectors in our society now the problem on this right-wing nationalism which is and xenophobia uh and other uh, racism uh and other right-wing tendencies including this anti-terrorist hysteria, which is being which is being uh, funded or so fueled by uh, the global war on terror, 
which was led by the U.S. And now, and now being taken advantage by uh, right right wing people, even for example in the Philippines. But they are the people behind it. There are only so many people who just. But adding a rena. Adding a rena. There's a separate discussion going on. There is. Yeah, adding a rena. There is not me. You know, from look at adding a rena. Windell, continue. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, to uh, answer directly the question after that uh, little uh, background and uh, good discussion with other uh, colleagues uh, in this uh, on this platform, how to resist these trends? One, we should be very clear who are our enemies. We should be very clear who are our allies. So uh, the, we should identify to whose political framework and ideology these trends are coming from and who are the uh, promoters of these uh, reactionary trends and right-wing trends because these are detrimental to indigenous peoples. Now from a po point of view of an indigenous peoples movement, one, it is important to expose this uh this uh this trends this uh right wing right wing uh, tendencies and trends in the world today because these are being used to attack indigenous peoples and other oppressed peoples and marginalized sectors in every um, in every society we have to build a unity against our common enemy the common enemy of indigenous peoples and other oppressed nations and nationalities and peoples in the world is not uh, is not xenophobia, the, is not racism. The problem is neoliberal globalization. And at the uh, in, in our home country, as I said a while ago, the prevailing power relations, as uh, demonstrated by the power structure, social pyramid structure in our society. We have to be clear that our that our common enemy, whether indigenous peoples or non-indigenous peoples in the world today, are those who are promoting and the drivers of neoliberal globalization, which is imperialist globalization. In our own country, those at the top of the social pyramid structure, so that we will not be uh, deceived, we will not be confused with these right-wing uh, tendencies that are being used by this... Uh, uh, imperialist forces or big capitalist forces who are promoting and planning to uh, uh, confuse us in our own strategy and line of advance. Thank you. Thank you, Winda. Let's next move to uh, Govinda. Would you share, take one minute shorter uh, and uh, yeah, short time, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you again, Gam. Um, yes, Wendell, uh, um, yes, uh, responded clearly on this. When we talk about the xenophobia or nationalisms, or this is the matter of when uh, I think that this is the matter of uh, uh, hateness, the nationalism, for example. Nationalism means that the uh, it creates uh, the line that the we and them, or we, uh, uh, we and they, we versus they, or uh, us versus them. This kind of idea is basically about the nationalism, when we, I talk uh, from, from my side. But the indigenous governance systems relating to this concern is that uh, we already discuss a lot uh, about the collectiveness, and then equality, justice, and the uh, the idea and values. Since long time, they have been practicing this kinds of system, governing system, which is basically based on the uh, justice, uh, equality, 
and 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 and, and uh, accommodate the different kinds of ideas uh, and respecting and recognizing equally uh, to all kinds of uh, peoples and perspective so uh, the this is yeah i agree that the now this kind when we talk about the self determination when we talk about the self governance system it means that the this is uh, the counter argument people always uh, make a kind of narratives that the this is a kind of racism or this is a kind of um, um or this is a kind of um, i mean that the yeah, xenophobia uh, but the, this is not the matter from the perspective of indigenous people this is just only the narrations to 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 kill the uh, genuine issues of the indigenous peoples uh, i think in i think so uh, uh, so uh, from the my side is that uh, when we talk about the self government uh, is not only for the indigenous communities it is for the all kinds of people all kinds of peoples in terms of uh, for example when we talk about the resources or uh, natural resources as a land territories uh, and protect promotions uh, and they have their own knowledge system they have their own belief system they have their own which is really really uh, yes jenny already talk about the sustainability right uh, th this is this is my uh, intervention thank you uh, govind ji for the response now um, ruka would you like to take on can you unmute me already okay yeah already. thank you very much. um uh, i agree very much with our uh, window then uh, however all these um uh right wings uh, movement and um intolerance movement uh, racism uh, xenophobic uh, movement has been increasing and give even more pressure on indigenous peoples as 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 uh Winder mentioned earlier this i also use like for example anti-terrorism law used to again capture and and uh, oppress indigenous peoples furthermore uh, there are also uh, uh one incident in indonesia where COVID has been used by the government to arrest uh, uh activists so these are these are all the new things that is already we are already having uh, uh, so much burden and then again on top of that but what we have to also understand as actually indigenous peoples for the sake of the nation's uh, interest indigenous peoples are the foundations where and a very critical value when we need to be hand in hand and fighting all this extremism um, indigenous peoples we are our collective uh, system our collective system based on respect solidarity it is truly the uh, way of the value of showing the respect for differences why do we why it takes so long for us to make decisions uh, as indigenous peoples in our collective decision making process because we that the principal failure of us is respect for diversity for differences that's where all these uh extremisms uh radicalisms or whatsoever how you call it the right wing um movement don't have that so we we have all the failure to face them the problem is they come and hijacking others as uh, as uh, Windel uh, source, and then that's true that in indigenous uh, communities where we are trying to exercise our political rights, we are they because they are trying to take over the leadership um, from the village level up to the presidential level, and we are really face to face with them. We are the one who fight them on the ground. Yeah. Uh, we've seen our candidates that is running for the elections of the uh, local village uh, for the village level are being intimidated. Indigenous peoples are being intimidated by these extremist gro groups. And why? And why? Because they knew that they need to destroy the confidence of indigenous peoples in our own system. Because if they defeat us, 
the, if they defeat us, they will delegitimate our governance system, our rights to self determinations, our leaderships. Yeah. So I think uh, these are the the. It is not new because it's been there. You know, racism is always there, but it is being used by the uh, uh, powerful elites. And in the end, again, not just the threat of our existence as indigenous peoples, but really the threat to our lands and territory and resources. I think, uh, and so if the country wants to combat all these extremisms, they need to work with indigenous peoples because we have proved in Amman that we are the one who face them face to face on the ground. So that's uh, that's uh, for for from from me based on our experience. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Gam, again. Yes, thank you, Ruka. I think uh, that's a very contextual explanation, and it can be a learning in other countries as well. Now, I'm not sure if Bidayak is going to come back, but so let's move to Jenny, and if he comes back, we'll also hear from him. So Jenny, would you like to sort of take the last breath for all of us <laughs> thank you Gem, and thank you to other i've been listening so i'll i won't receive uh, repeat your points first of all i think uh, indigenous peoples uh, have been discriminated for centuries so that background of being discriminated discriminated upon should uh, be a very uh, important uh, basis that we we won't do that to another uh, group of people so uh, xenophobia uh, op uh, will, should not be, or at least uh, should be a lesson that we all take. And openness, uh, I think, in indigenous society is always been known uh, to the point that we are uh, taken advantage of. Uh, so um, that's point number one. The second one is uh, on nationalism. Um, to counter this, I uh, I mentioned earlier about having this strategic uh, orientation uh, and when we talk about self-government. So um, the question, we always have to ask the question, what kind of society are we trying to build? So when we ask that question and our leaders also try to live up to those uh, uh, reasonings, I think those should be the things that will uh, tell to other society uh, that are around us. Uh, and to really bring down this idea of right-wing nationalism, xenophobia, and so on. So uh, just on, on those two points, uh, because I think the others have mentioned it. So really uh, the people's vision, indigenous people's vision should, if we put it strongly, uh, should be able to counter any kind of xenophobia and uh, right-wing uh, right nationalism. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Jenny. I think uh, the lessons that we must learn from uh, and also drawing from our tradition and values is something that you have pointed out. Now, I would like to just check whether Bidayak is back and you would like to add something, otherwise we will close. Bidayak, are you online? Otherwise, we will close. <clears throat> Okay, hello. <clears throat> uh, he hello. Yes, Vidal, yes. please uh, take uh, your one I'm minute. Here, but I think uh, our time is already up. So uh, I just endorse and agree with all, uh, all my uh, fellows uh, already uh, talk about. Uh, so I think, yes, in our CST context, I mean, in our uh, uh, Bangladesh, we uh, also, um, uh, practical in practical everyday life, we are facing the those uh, challenges. Uh, for example, in um, uh, during COVID, uh, in the early stages of um, COVID-19, and they used to say our us actually uh, look a hey, Chinese or a hey, uh, um, I mean Corona like that. So lots of the harassment we actually passing um, uh, in our own land. So lots of challenges. Uh, so I'm not talking much about it. I think already it's covered. So um, thank you again, and thank you very much uh, for uh, just uh, connecting me with your, uh, this very, very good uh, initiative, and thank you. Okay, thank you, Vidayak. At least you were able to come in for 
the last moment back again. <laughs> it has been a rough weather for you, <laughs> but somehow you are still there with us, so thank you. Now, I would not like to summarize because I think the panelists have been excellent in the presentation and they have been very precise and wonderfully presented. Uh, so to save time, I will not summarize, uh, but just two, I think, um, key messages that has come out uh, that I would like to point out is, of course, that one is looking towards a more just, sustainable and a better life. Uh, envisioning together indigenous peoples and governments and other societies together. Now, that should be the approach and attitudes. That's one, I think, key message uh, that is coming out. The other thing is that it is no more the time to be legally arguing about the legitimacy of indigenous people's right to self-determination. But now we should be focusing more on the framework and the process by which our self-governance can be realized uh, that is unique to indigenous peoples. And it is not just about embracing the state system, but about nurturing and developing with our own genius by utilizing our customary institutions, customary law, and so on. And there are many aspects to which indigenous peoples can contribute. You know, and Therefore, in transcending this current challenge of this right-wing nationalism, xenophobia, racism, etc., we need to uh, find ways in a constructive way to move forward by keeping those points in mind. I think just in a very nutshell, I know there are many other critical points pointed out by the panelists, but we will end the session here with um, that two or three messages that has come out. I would really like to thank all the panelists for giving the time and uh, making such a, a, a fruitful, uh, useful presentation for us to think about and also to take home from here. And of course, our participants of whom I know majority are the, our indigenous brothers and sisters who are also listening to us to be in dialogue and be together with all of us. No? So I really like to thank the participants and the panelists. And on behalf of the panelists, maybe we can just raise our hands together to acknowledge our indigenous brothers and sisters and the audience that we are all together. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We conclude the session. Yes. Thank you.